The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, traders. So uh, welcome to uh, Tuesday's uh, professional uh, trader webinar series. Uh, today we have Walter Lesikar and Brent Kochuba. Uh, so we've had Walter before, but uh, uh, Brent is new, uh, and uh, they've got a really interesting uh, slant here. So uh, Walter's a futures trader, and uh, uh, Brent is, I believe, as well, but uh, he, he's uh, uh, special specialty is in the options, uh, looking at uh, uh, how the options uh, will affect uh, the, uh, uh, the live market or in the, the futures market here. Uh, and uh, anyway, a quick bio uh, on Walter, trader, 10 years experience, uh, eight years looking at the order book. Uh, he's trading the ES, the CL, treasuries, uh, and um, uh, uh, his life defines his trading. When he reaches his goals, he quits uh, and goes and enjoys his life. Uh, he's a very passionate educator, as you guys probably know, um, of uh, the order book and order flow based on book map. Uh, Brent has been in equities and derivatives for almost 20 years now. Uh, he worked at B of A and Swiss, uh, Credit Suisse, uh, both as equities broker and in uh, algorithmic sales and trading. So he has a background in all of that. Uh, then uh, went on to institutional sales for Wolverine, uh, representing electronic derivatives trading platform. Uh, and then currently, uh, Brent is now um, uh, trades uh, proprietary uh, uh, strategies and runs SpotGamma.com, uh, which publishes very me various metrics on options data. So let me go through the risk disclaimer. I also want to show you another slide here of all the contact information for these guys if you want to reach out and contact them. So the risk disclaimer, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, uh, here's uh, Walter's uh, contact information and Brent's as well. Okay, now uh, I'll put this into the chat periodically uh, throughout the webinar so you guys don't have to uh, uh, write all this down or anything, but uh, uh, yeah, because there's quite quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of info here. Uh, anyway, uh, let me just uh, turn it right over. I think Brent is going to go first, and he's going to talk about uh, options here, and then Walter's going to come in second. Okay, okay, Brent. So uh, you just uh, there you go. You're all set. This up here. Yes. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you all for your time and for and for showing up today, and um, thanks for the opportunity to to speak. Um, so Walter and I have been working together to um, integrate some of my options data into uh, Bookmap in the form of cloud notes, and he's been uh, really helping me out, um, watching how futures, level re futures levels respond to uh, this options data that I collect. So the, the basis of what I do is I gather the open interest for the SPY and the SPX, uh, all the options open interest, and I run options risk models that calculate uh, where options hedgers uh, may start to participate in the market and how they may participate in the market. And what you will see and what we hope to show you today is that the futures market, uh, as it is obviously linked to the S&P 500, uh, will react and pin or bounce off of or uh, otherwise um, move along with many of these levels. So when we're going to talk about things, just to give you a sort of a view of where we're going, there's there's two basic things I want to talk to you about today. One is this concept of total market gamma, and that is basically telling you how dealers are going to hedge, meaning are they going to trade with the market or against the market, and I'll show you why that's important. And then the second one are these ideas of call and put walls. Where are the open interest levels concentrated in the market, and where might dealers start to hedge, and or where might uh, volatility change, based on where open interest sits. And obviously we're looking at options here, but my goal is to show you that the options matter to the futures market because I believe that a very large part of the way that market makers hedge their SPX positions is using uh, futures. And so you will see the um, their flows will impact obviously um, the, the futures market. So again, what we're boiling down here is the study of market gamma which relates to volume so i'm going to talk a lot about this greek called gamma and most of you probably familiar with what that is but you can just picture in your head when i say when gamma is high or positive you know i'm talking about how much volume market makers may have to trade right so the higher let's say it's a very positive very large positive number that just means there's a lot of volume 
trading into the market. And if it's a very large negative number, that's a large amount of futures volume, you know, trading against the market or, or excuse me, with the market. And so what you end up here is you hear this game and I say game is high and game is big and game is this and game is that. Just know when I talk about gamma, it's just volume, right? If, if I say high gamma, that means high volume, high futures volume. And so number one, the questions we're looking at, number one is how much volume are they going to produce? And then two, are they long or short? And I'll explain what long or short is here in, in a second. So the interesting thing about gamma, and just to give you an idea of what this is measuring and what we're looking at, is when we calculate there's a high amount of gamma, uh, what that is telling you is that market makers are hedging into the market, meaning that as the market goes higher, they are selling futures, and as the market goes lower, they're buying futures. So you could picture them suppressing market volatility or suppressing market ranges when positive, when there's a lot of positive gamma. And so you can see in this density plot here, the blue area is the one day price movement of all data points we have where there's a positive market environment, a positive gamma environment. And then conversely, in the orange here, you see that these are all the data points when there's a negative gamma environment. So you can see that the price distribution is much, much wider when we have a negative gamma environment. When it's positive, it's a much tighter trading range on the day. So if you're a futures trader and you're mapping out your levels for the day and you want to know, hey, where might the market go? Where should I be buying and selling, et cetera? This could be very powerful information, right? Because where do you know, like, hey, I need to let something run or maybe do I want to play a fairly tight range and play a, you know, a, a buy the dip or sell the rip type situation? So this this is sort of the core of what the, what the data can help you um, uh, map out for your for your, uh, for your strategy. This is another way of looking at the same chart. Each of these data points is a uh, so you have the our gamma index here on the x-axis, and then the one day forward return, meaning what does the market do tomorrow uh, based on that data point. And you can see that when we have high positive gamma, it's a very tight trading range. And then as gamma gets more negative, you can see this trading range really expands and widens out. And so this flip point is something I'm talking about a lot about today, but you see this gamma flip point is a, is a demarcation line, we'd say between volatility uh, and, and relative calm in the market. And you can see it's a very stark contrast based on how much market gamma we have. Here's another way of, of looking at, at you know, these gamma markers. So every green dot shows you when there's a positive gamma market and every red dot is when it's a negative gamma environment. And so you can see that if you can catch a lot of times when the market flips from a positive, we have positive gamma that flips to negative, that can be the demarcation or the line at which volatility is really going to expand. So the most recent one was obviously in, in February, at the end of February, you know, we had this mark here, this plot here was the Friday, I believe it was the 24th. And then over that weekend, you know, everything really kind of fell apart. And so you can see that there's a very tight sort of distribution and prices are generally moving higher. Granted, it's been a bull market over these last two years, uh, but it's a fairly tight volatility. It's a fairly tight range and the market just kind of grinds ahead. And then when we get to these negative game environments, prices really expand, not just to the downside, that volatility also counts to the upside, right? I mean, I don't need to tell you that, uh, you know, the price movement as of late has been, uh, has been pretty wild. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but volatility simply is telling you that price is going to move a lot. It's not necessarily a directional indication. Uh, here's another way of, of just looking at that. This is the VIX mapped over, you know, the gamma environment. So red is actually when we have positive gamma and green is where we have negative gamma. So the prices are sort of, or the colors are sort of inverted, I guess, from what you'd expect. But you can see that we really get an expansion in volatility again with negative gamma. Um, so what is what goes into my model? Well, I assume that all puts are bought from dealers, meaning that the customer or the initiating trade is generally buying puts and they're selling calls. So that ends up with a, a position where dealers are essentially long a call or on the SPX, right? So um, long call, short put is basically like synthetic stock. So if they want to hedge, they're generally going to be shorting futures into the market as it goes higher and or they're happy to sort of let the market go higher because decay and other things makes them money. Um, so that's the basic model assumption. I'm happy to talk to people offline. It's a longer conversation about why we assume these things. Um, but that's sort of the basic underlying assumption if you want to put that in the back of your mind when we're when we're looking at some of these models. All right, so on to mapping out um, the, the data here. So this is from today's data. Um, what we do is we took all the open interest and we mapped out exactly where that open interest lies in gamma terms um, onto this 
uh, onto this chart. I measure things in gamma terms and not in open interest terms because gamma gives weight. Gamma is highest for an at the money option. So at the money options are obviously most relevant to what we're trading today. And if I just looked at open interest by itself, well, a, a very far out of the money call or put may have a lot more open interest than the 3,200 strike, which is obviously where we're trading right now. So by weighting it with gamma, you really get a feeling for what matters in the market. So you can see that the 3,200 level today is very key. Uh, it's where they're the most calls, which is gonna be represented here in, in terms of the, the long gamma and puts is this negative gamma component here, the negative gamma piece of the line. You can see that's where a lot of the data, where the open interest sits. So in theory, what we're going to see today is if the market starts to move ahead, we'll see futures uh, start to sell to bring the market back to the 3200 line. And conversely, if the market goes below, we're going to see the market revert back to 3200 as dealers step in to buy. You also see these other big areas of open interest. And, and these are levels that we map out in book map. And I'll show you that in a couple minutes. These levels are also key levels with big open interest. So if you're going to say, I want to play a range move from 3,200, but where may I want to look for a stop? Well, our data would say 3,225 would be a level of, of big interest, right? And so these levels come up time and time again in the options market uh, and, in the, and then conversely in, in, the, in the futures market, or I'll say an associated way in the futures market. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, and people often ask, you know, can the options market you know, really have that much of an impact. Um, and this is sort of an anecdotal thing. I think it's very interesting considering everything that's been going on. But, you know, we have not only the price distribution, which I've shown, but each one of these X, X marks maps out the, uh, the third Friday of every month, which is when the SPX monthly contracts expire. That is the biggest options expiration. And uh, there's three expirations a week. Those tend to be a little bit smaller. The monthlies are the biggest one. And then of those, the quarterly expirations, which is gonna be this June, uh, which is quad witching, et cetera, uh, comes up. So you can see that not every single expiration, but very often there is an a expiration that marks a turning point in the market. And that was the case here. Uh, this was December of 2018. Um, and then here you have, you know, obviously some notable ones along the way. Uh, this was the February options expiration of a few, um, uh, a few months ago. And I would note that we had, similar to today, we had record call positioning in the market. Um, and so what happened was we had record call expiration uh, calls expire. If you think about what that means is that dealers then have a whole bunch of features to sell because they were hedging uh, call positions with long, uh, long stock or long futures, and then they had to suddenly sell all those positions. And so I think that's part of what helped expand volatility. Um, so this Friday obviously was the mark of the, of a major, um, the major move lower. This X, which is the March expiration, which had a record amount of in-the-money puts, uh, the, the low was the Monday following this expiration, the March expiration. So that was the ultimate low. And then we're going to come in here with June expiration, which is uh, a week from today. We obviously have the Fed tomorrow. Uh, so I put a little red star there to note that for everybody. Um, we'll see what happens, but uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, data point. So onto our research. Every day we put out in, in, these, in these emails, in uh, and, and daily emails on our website, all of these different levels. So these levels are, are basically names that we've created to mark important levels in the options market. So on this particular day, we had what we call a top gamma strike, which is where the most call positions are. And that is typically resistance level. Um, that was at 3000. And then we have these other ideas of, uh, of zero gamma and our ball trigger. So the zero gamma and ball trigger, I'm not going to differentiate those, differentiate those in the interest of time, but basically that's those are measures where gamma will flip from positive to negative, and those will often be support and resistance uh, lines to play, and, and I'll show an example of that in a second. Um, but by, out, by laying out all these different levels, you can get important information and sort of have an understanding of what the, uh, the market makers may be doing uh, for today. One of the interesting things to note about options market makers and why I think it's so important is that if you think about an average buyer, right, if a hedge fund comes in to buy some futures or, or you know, even a large prop shop or whatever, they have essentially like an exhausted, exhaustive um, supply of, of, uh, of money they can put in the market, right? They, they may maybe want to buy, you know, 100 futures if they're really big or whatever it may be, but they'll run out of uh, they'll, they'll run out of money at some point, right? Well, if you think about what the market makers are doing, they're hedging something. And so they're constantly in and out of the market and they're active or can be active all day long. 
So their volume is a little bit different from an average buyer or seller because they're constantly trafficking in the market in and out as, as options volumes trading all day, they need to adjust their positions. And so they're I believe they're a very large part of the market just on an individual trade basis, but that is also volume that, that continues throughout the day. Um, so along with this, this chart here and laying out the, the various levels, then you're gonna get on the side uh, to the right here, a bunch of other statistics relating to the market. We go into depth on those, not only on our website, there's videos, uh, and the like, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna skip ahead on that again in the interest of time. But just know that what we're doing here is mapping out the important levels in the market. Um, and again, these are refreshed every single day uh, and then pushed out the book map. Uh, just to give you a quick example, I thought this is one of the most fascinating examples. I don't know if you all remember um, back at the end of last year, there was a uh, the when Iran bombed Iraq, and it was a fascinating example because in the morning we put out this research, and this is 3185 was our zero gamma level. The market will very often bounce off of that level. It's it's quite interesting, and it can be at sort of obscure levels. So this night we had uh, the night going into the night we had pretty pretty large amount of positive gamma. The news broke. And the market immediately trades down to this zero gamma level and then mean reverts back to exactly where it was before and if you look through that trade or that move through my eyes uh, this is what exactly the market makers are going to do right the way that their position requires them to as the market drops they're going to start buying futures right so the market kind of moves down hits their key level and they want to buy futures back uh, to get their hedge you know back in place and so we'll see these types of moves play out all the time and in very interesting ways um, there was obviously the you know the february move here which i talked about um you know quite a bit already today but you know this was our research from that friday telling you that this was the key level uh 3310 was our volatility volatility trigger you know where we see gamma flipping from positive to negative and you can see that once we broke that level that really opened the floodgates that really told you that look dealers are going to start selling futures as the market goes lower and so oftentimes you need a news catalyst or you need something else to break, but once it breaks, they're jumping on board and they can really expand volatility. So when we talk about book map and, and some of the levels, Walter's gonna to touch on this, but I just wanna give an example of how we map these things out. So here, you, this is our, this graph comes out in the emails every morning, and you can see that these levels will come up all over the place that we map them out. So in other words, we have this high gamma strike, which is where we consider the most call positions, and that's typically resistance. If you think about dealers being long a bunch of calls, well, as the market approaches that strike, the 2900 strike in this case, they're gonna start selling futures into that to hedge their calls, right? So that was why we view that as a major resistance point. Conversely, you see that the same day we traded down to this zero gamma level and that seemed to really hold the market in uh, and, and prove to be you know, an important hedging level uh, for the end of the day. So these, these levels as they're mapped out, you know, they're not always at big round numbers like 2900, they can be at some more obscure levels, but you'll see them come up again, you know, time and time again. Um, one of the other things that I think Walter will touch on this a little bit more is that we'll see, and as evidence of this, uh, of the impact of options, you'll see that there's what I call persistent liquidity will show up at these levels. So many of you obviously are book map users, and so you'll see these big bands of liquidity that will be pretty far away from the market. And a lot of times that liquidity lines up exactly with where our spot gamma levels are, as you can see here on the um, on the chart here at the right. And those are levels which dealers may need to hedge, right? If they know that the market's gonna go up a percent and that equals where they need to sell it or buy a bunch of features, well, why not just have some liquidity resting out there? As it's a hedge for them, they may not be as worried um, about presenting that liquidity or letting everybody know that's the price that they're at, or they may wait also want to just draw people into that you know specific level because that's where they you know they know they need to hedge. Um, so you can see these you know these fingerprints or these related um, these these options levels uh, show up in the futures on a on a on a daily basis. Um, so here, here's my quick contact. I know that was showed showing as well as the morning. Um, in the interest of time, I know it was pretty pretty quick and pretty brief. I'm going to move on to Walter. Uh, and let him him take from there. And I think we're going to take some questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. Um, I have to change my my screen. Um, okay. I think is that one. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, it's book map. Okay, I don't see the control screen here, but anyway, good. 
Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, and thank you, Brent. I'd like to complete Brent's presentation showing how I'm using spot gamma levels with just-in-time indicators in my daily trading. Uh, spot gamma and bookmap um, fits perfectly together, and I will tr uh, tr uh, try to show you how they fit together. Um, what I think is that bookmap is telling every trade in real time what a liquid market is doing and what it intends to do, and spot gamma levels uh, indicates possible turning points, as Brent uh, pointed out and uh, mentioned uh, before, combined with liquidity in bookmap, and that makes the, the um, um, yes the, the, this this technique of spot gamma and bookmap highly interesting. As, uh, it's not a secret uh, to most of you uh, who knows me is that I'm a fan of correlations in my courses as well, online seminar. So, uh, I'm talking about correlations and how important they are. Uh, I'm firmly in, convinced that nothing works in isolation, even not, even not markets. If this is true, then we must have a broader look if we want to be and stay profitable in our trading. Uh, given you are trading ES futures, then the ES futures the only base where you hope to make money with. Did you ever consider to look for positively and negatively correlated markets for ES? Positively, when I'm talking about positively correlated markets in, uh, for ES, for, I'm thinking about or talking about SPY, for example, or QQQ for N uh, NASDAQ. And negatively correlated markets uh, like uh, VIX or, excuse me, the volatility index, cash or futures. Or um, last year we had the, the US dollar yen as a correlated market, which uh, worked great last year. Treasuries as well, of course. Uh, coming back to options and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, spot gamma. This multi billion influential industry out there are the hedge funds, of course. Uh, they need to hedge, and as Brent man, man, uh, mentioned, and they are dependent on their positions. They must either buy back shares of futures or they must sell shares of futures. And that we can see every day or nearly every day in the ES future if you are trading your uh, ES future. They are not trading only few future contracts. So money, logically, they are moving millions by saying that they are act according their mathematical programs to hedge. Um, as said before, if you want to be successful in trading, we should have a broader look on adjacent and correlated market. Come on here. Before I proceed to show how to utilize the concept of spot gamma and bookmap in my trading, um, I need a few minutes to explain the liquidity concept in order to show how spot gamma and bookmap are tied together. As a bookmap user, we are interested to see where possible market turning points are. One of the concepts we have is to use liquidity as our guidance. What I'm teaching is that liquidity is divided in three categories. I'm, I'm talking or we are talking about long-term high liquidity, short-term high liquidity, and very short-term high liquidity, which is mainly used <clears throat> for spoofing uh, or driving markets in one direction within seconds. On this chart, on this presentation here, you see long-term high liquidity, which um, I would like to say is uh, lasting in the book or sitting in the book may, longer than 30 minutes, maybe one hour, two hours, three hours, depending on day and the circumstances. And uh, um, you will see that and spot them very, very long in the book or staying in the book. And the nice thing is that the, uh, the price is always seeking liquidity for example, so long-term liquidity. And on the other side, I would like to point to the short-term high liquidity here, which you can see as this uh, very short orange red areas here around, in this case, in this example, around 29.35. It's, um, it's there, it's placed there as a kind of resistance or ceiling, if you want to use this word, uh, as a ceiling to resist this price. And what Bookmap is telling us every day, not only that this is, a, this is a huge, big, big resistance at this level here, at this, that price level here, and um, it tells also that this short-term high liquidity is there because the market makers wanted the price down. And it tells more than that. Look at the at a place be, uh, beside this uh, red um, or orange area. It's 
it's black or it's um, light blue. That means there is no liquidity. This um, action was intentional. That's intentional trading. That's really what the market makers all do. All they are doing, uh, driving the market up or driving the market down, depends on. And you can read it literally um, every day in bookmap like this one. Um, this this right dark red areas they are then turning into orange and then disappearing out of the book. It's uh, a combination of the limit order book. I'm also a fan of the limit order book of the dome because you can see the resting orders here and every price level. What I'm using this, I'm using the limit order book simply not only to read the limit order book, um, to follow the numbers for myself, and I'm speaking only about, about, about myself. It's a little bit um, tiresome, so I don't uh, do that, but I have the translation of this number in the book, in, in book map, in this workspace, and I can see the pulling and stacking on this side and what the market makers are doing. So, um, this volume changes, uh, the limit order book volume changes constantly, and the dynamic of liquidity can be understood without doubt it's not it's not a rocket science though so, um, for a beginner there will be a lot of questions for example when is liquidity reliable which level of liquidity is reliable differences between resting liquidity in the book what are the intentions of market makers and there are a lot of questions around liquidity and discussions are of course around uh, liquidity um, coming back to correlations like options uh, as that, uh, I would like to add what, what Brent mentioned before, Spot Gamma for Bookmap is a great concept to attach or, or um, adopt the essence of option market to Bookmap. It combines option knowledge with visual support of limit and market volume, which is visualized in Bookmap. Let's go a little bit further then. That's what you get from Spot Gamma if you, uh, if you subscribe to Spot Gamma is the levels, the levels which are, uh, which are leaning on the SPX absolute gamma levels, which are um, presented or which are published every day. And you get this Spot Gamma levels um, automatically via cloud nodes in Bookmap. They are automatically updated so that you don't need to care uh, about updates. Um, as mentioned before, I'm, I'm repeating my, uh, myself and that what Brand said is spot gamma levels uh, represent levels calculated on the SPX and adopted or uh, adjusted to the S future. The annotation is based on this example. Uh, we have, this, that's on yesterday's example, we have the XPS X level 3200. Uh, level zero means uh, the priority. Um, that that was the highest priority in the in this present uh, not presentation but in this um, uh, in this chart here. That means we are de we dealt yesterday with the highest um, open interest uh, level here at 3200. That means it was 3197 if I remember right, and the 6.0 means uh, the um, call gamma is the actual call gamma plus put, put gamma. So far, I understood, Brent. This is the, yes, let me say the, this, um, the subtraction between uh, eight or nine and this number four. That means we have six billion, uh, six billion calls in the market, six billion more calls in the market than puts here at that, ball, at that point. And um, this open interest, uh, from my point of view, as, uh, as well as Brent mentioned, is acts like a volume node because it represent, re represents potential hedging levels and it is highly interesting how they are working so on some days you will see there are really resistance and some day you will see there are really support the question now is how do we know um, where to trade i will show you an example based on yesterday's es shortly uh, additional levels of interest, which uh, which are plotted in or uh, marked in Bookmap, are not only this um, SPX levels, the option option interest le option open interest levels for Bookmap, um, which represent the potential hedging levels. It's also the volatility trigger, which is indic which indicates a possible shift from positive to negative. Then we have the zero gamma level, a highly interested uh, level 
Brent mentioned that he is a specialist of Zero Gamma, and we should have a very, very close a look every day at Zero Gamma level to understand what market, what type of market we have, mean reverting market or not a re mean reverting market. And uh, the Zero Gamma level is the level where positive gamma flips to negative gamma, and you will see an experience when it comes when the price comes to the um, zero gamma. It acts often as support or resistance levels, and if it breaks to that level, means a shift from mean reverting market market to directional market. What um, also Brent um, depicted in his uh, presentation. Uh, a new la label, a new mar a marker is the SBX SBX SBY combo. It's uh, a combination of SPX and SPY gamma for the day, for the actual day. As said, um, and Brent uh, is doing this every day. If something changes here, he is, con he is actually, or he dynamically also changes the, the, the marker or the levels for bookmap, and you will get them uh, via cloud notes automatically in your bookmap. So, um, Let's have a look at yesterday's ES future example, how to determine a possible reversal in the market and what tools you have to do that. Uh, as first of all, you see the um, spot gamma levels, the SBX, SPY combo at 30, um, 32.08. It, is actual, it was actually at 32.04 and then the SBX 32 level, the priority, the, the highest priority with the most open interest volume um was at around uh, 31.97 in my prep work uh, when i'm showing that in my room or on twitter i'm adding lines to all my levels i'm watching to get a kind of uh, of let me say trading map it's it's uh, i'm calling it trading map because it helps me to focus on important areas and to um yes to focus on this area and to see what happens around in this area or around this area. Um, we in this <clears throat> excuse me, in this example, we have following tools. By the way, um, all tools we are dealing with with Bruce is uh, showing you or I'm showing you are based on NBO data. That means market by order data. There is no smoothing, there is no averaging uh, whatever on these uh, indicators. This is these are pure real time market data. So on this chart tools, I'm using um, the spot gamma as mentioned, the TTW market volume pro indicator. I will show you another so a few uh, two uh, additional functions of TTW market volume pro, which shows every stop run what the market is doing here. And uh, what I'm using additionally is the SI tracker, which shows the iceberg absorptions at certain levels. That's quite important. We have several absor absorptions, one on the pure liquidity, if um, volume hits liquidity, and then if there's no liquidity around, most of them are absorbed by icebergs or iceberg volume, which is uh, not visible directly in the limit order book or in the dome because it is attached to one order and they are firing completely um, until they absorb every volume which is coming in here at, this, uh, at a certain level. Together with Bookmap's uh, liquidity concept, uh, it gives you a huge advantage over all other charting techniques I know and believe me, I know nearly everyone. So. Um, Let's have a look at the event at around 31, at this event here, around 31.94, 31.95. We have the SPX level here, as mentioned before, with the highest OER or um, open interest uh, for, the, for this day, for yesterday. Um, and we have this level around this uh, 31.97. But have a look at the 39, uh, 31.94 into 95 level, you see here and stop run into the 95 level then immediately an iceberg uh, indicator iceberg uh, indicator fired that means uh, iceberg absorbed this level here at that point at 94 um, and that signs when we have such signs that mean something we must we must not ignore them we have to have a look uh, um, a closer look at them uh, the point here is I want I would like to mention if you missing this information that means if you don't have spot gamma if you don't care about options if you don't care about correlations if you don't care about 
any other, um, let me say, indication, then um, this kind of volume, this um, kind of price action would be probably fooled you into a selling position. That means if you see that on a candle chart or any other chart you are using, it means it can fool you to sell this because you think, oh, okay, it's going down, it's rapidly going down, it stops here, okay, that's a little break, then I'm going short, I'm going short, it, and maybe it works for one, two points, maybe a few ticks here, but you are missing this information, you are missing the iceberg, you are missing the stop, <clears throat> stop run here, you are missing the spot gamma level, um, and you are missing even a nice divergence here, will I, what, which I want to show you in the next slide. So you're missing the liquidity level, which is absorbing this volume here at 95 level. And um, that's the kind of information you need. Um, you need desperately to, 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 to survive in this business. We can't follow the markets, you know, the last days and weeks uh, logically. Um, because they are totally detached from the eco econo economy, not only in the US, but also here worldwide. So we have to follow certain facts and objectivity, which is giving, uh, which um, uh, was given us by the limit order book, by the real data we are getting here. So this is one example uh, based on the TTW Market Volume Pro and the SI tracker and Spot Gamma. The same picture, here a little bit reduced so not to confuse you with uh, lines and curves here is yes, the TTW market volume pros gives you an additional clue it is calculated um, simply not only to um, indicate spot uh, 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 stop runs but it calculates are also buyers versus sellers that means when the this line or this curve is going up that means the sellers are yes, um, decreasing or they're on retweeting and buyers are coming in, buyers are coming in, buyers are coming in. So we have spot gamma, which is an absolutely important level. Uh, it's not said that the price is going to the tick to 31.97, but uh, we need maybe additional tools to understand really what the price is doing around the spot gamma levels. And it indicates a nice absorption at, at this point here. Um, 9.30 or maybe 9.28 my uh, EST um, AM, uh, yes, EST time. Uh, this was uh, quite um, shortly after the open. And then we can see that the buy stepped in, are, try, are stepping in, stepping in, going in. And then when they break the zero line or they're crossing, when they are crossing, excuse me, to break, but when they are crossing the zero line, so the buyers constantly st um, come, came in and and bought and, and um, have been buying, have been buying here. And this liquidity, this short term liquidity here, I'm talked about before at 95 level, supported this move. And then they supported this move here and, um, and at um, 98, 99, and so on and so on. So, what I want to say with these pictures is that we need objective information, not, uh, not something um, artificial. Uh, or based on uh, data, not rely, not enough reliable data. I would like to say that that the way. And um, when we have this kind of information, we can objectively uh, understand, or we can understand what a market is doing, how important these levels are, what are, what is the price doing around these levels, and then taking our our uh, or executing or taking our position in trading. You can also see the imbalance between buyers and sellers here very very clearly so that red, we, uh, red means sellers and green means buyers there's a huge difference at the st this was the point at the stop run which was um, also indicated by the iceberg and um, every imbalance in the market must be rebalanced that means um, this isn't a directional yes indication together with spot gamma levels, with icebergs, with stop runs, shows clearly to buy this area instead following the crowd and be trapped in a selling position. And that's what, yet that was the result of yesterday's trading. Um, simply unbelievable. Um, as well, you can see that the SPX, SPY combo at 32.05 or 7, this area here, 
um, not clearly to see at this compressed and zoomed in picture, but uh, you see it was clearly a support level for a long time, for a long time here. So that's that's really one, two, three hours here. It was a support level and then they are jumped up to the 27, 30, 23, uh, 32, 30, 30 level here at, at about uh, this point here. And that's what we talked about in the previous um, slides, previous presentation, uh, yeah, slides. Um, this was that area where the market stopped, where it was absorbed and when the buyers started to come in into the market and drove the market up to the 30 levels. If you are, if you understand that and you tra was, was trading that, that means that it's a gain of 20 to 30 points, not 20 points, 25 points, whatever here. Okay, it's absolutely easy if you decide to use, the, to use uh, cloud nodes and to use spot gamma it's absolutely easy to implement. You need maybe only no, no, even a few seconds to do, the, to do that. Uh, Bruce did an extremely great job. Uh, every every single function of Bookmap you can find on YouTube. Just uh, follow the link here. Um, maybe yes, Bruce, you can post this link also in the room. Um, just follow his um, instructional videos to set up uh, cloud nodes. It's absolutely easy once you get the link. Uh, the URL from uh, Brent, then you can uh, place it into the Cloud Notes download URL, and that's it. It is. It will be automatically updated every day um, before before the open, so you have time to build your own map. And I would like to motivate every one of you to yes to have a build to to build your map to have an overview of uh, of possible of possible events along the day along the trading day it helps you to stay on the right side of the market so um try some information if you want uh, so, yes brent mentioned spotgamma.com there's a page spotgamma book map book excuse me book map levels uh, on his page, please visit that if you're interested to subscribe to, to his service. Then what uh, I'm, uh, I'm offering is ttwtrader.com. There are a lot of articles, posts around bookmap and trading. Um, bookmap education you will find also on ttwtrader.com and shop. And if you're interested in the TTW Market Volume Pro indicator, it's uh, on bookmaps marketplace, uh, marketplace.bookmap.com product TTW market volume pro. So that's that's all what I wanted to say. Um, thank you, Bruce, for the invitation. And uh, we are open for questions, if there are any. Okay, uh, excellent. Um, uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, really fascinating uh, presentation. Um, and uh, let me, let's open up the questions here. Uh, and um, uh, right off the bat, Paul is asking um, for the presentation slides, uh, Brent, and uh, uh, don't sure. know if, if you're uh, interested in handing those out or not. Um, but um, sure. okay, uh, uh, great. I, actually, you know what? I think you can even uh, hear. Uh, just there's a, a handouts folder. Uh, you might be able to just um, uh, drag and drop it right into that handouts uh, folder. I'll try to do that now. Yeah, so then we can just uh, save uh, time on the emails and the back and forth on that. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, and let me, uh, while we're doing that, let me uh, put into the chat all of the, uh, as well as that um, uh, Cloud Notes video, I'm going to add to the uh, to the, the list. Yeah. Um, there you go. Okay, so... And uh, so uh, this is all the uh, contact information for um, both Brent and Walter uh, and uh, and that Cloud Notes video as well. Uh, so you guys have that. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Justin is asking here about uh, um, it's kind of the the this these uh, gamma levels um, uh, when. Um, when it hits important important levels, um, uh, does it go from a, a wall uh, to I don't know what you mean by wall uh, uh, to dealers, uh, Justin, um, uh, to fueling uh, the uh, the fire 
uh, and hedging down to, uh, down to the downside or or upside yeah. moves. Yeah. So uh, the the general idea is that when we're in a, a positive gamma environment, uh, so so today, for instance, um, thirty let's say thirty two hundred was our resistance level. The farther the market goes over that level, we would guess that more resistance is piled on, like more futures would be sold. If you're looking at the zero gamma level would be the only place where if that support level breaks, then the state change of the market may change, right? So if we break that volatility trigger, that may start to bring on dealer selling. So they would go from like buying the dip to, to selling the dip, if that makes sense. Right. I'm not sure. If that's our right. I think I believe that's, that's Justin's question, question here. Um, and um, let's see one more question. Uh, get to the portion. I, I can drag uh, and drop the uh, presentation. Is okay, great. Um, so, yeah, what do you have for maximum depth on, on the positive and negative uh, delta set to? Is that, I think that's a Walter question, probably. Uh, I believe it's on, on for, for you on, on, the, uh, on the options. Um, the positive, the maximum gamma meaning? Uh, Justin, uh, do you mean that is that is is it for Walter or is that for uh, for Brent? Uh, for Brent. So I have a maximum. So the maximum there's no maximum minimum uh, gamma level um, to, to to watch for. Um, it's just whatever levels are the most significant around where the market is trading. Obviously, when we get into like a, a zero gamma type environment or a low gamma environment, the, the levels may have less options associated with them. And that is why, as, as you could see on uh, Walter's screen, I, I do put a size notation there to let everybody know roughly how big the level is. Obviously, a bigger level should have more pull, right? Like 3200 right now is the biggest level. So it should have more pull to it uh, and should be a, a more significant um, a level to watch. The other thing to note is that a lot of times you'll see the levels in the first half of the day the market will react very strongly to them and then they kind of wear off uh into the afternoon and i think that's because they're not big levels to begin with but then also you have options volume come in during the day and so the levels can kind of lose a little bit of their uh, their size or gain size you know depending on what volume is doing but when you get a very very big level like 3200 you know those will stick through the day so it's important to know what the size is so if you see on the screen there uh, at the left, there's in, in white under the gamma column, you'll see SPX 3200, and you see L0 is the biggest level, and then 6.0 is the is the actual gamma level or how much gamma is there. And then if you look towards the bottom, there's another level that's only 2.0. So that's telling you that the size is only 2 million versus 6 billion. Uh, so I hope that's interesting. Helpful. Yeah, no, it, actually, this is kind of, I, I had kind of similar question, like uh, as the day progresses, like uh, because you're, you know these these days when um, uh, there's not volatility and it's grinding higher, um, does the uh, the the gamma level kind of switch to to the upside uh, later in the day? Um, yeah, it, it it does. So like what what I always tell in the daily notes is like one of the keys to watch is is volatility. And I watch the VIX, and if, if the VIX is going down, that's generally telling you that there's pressure up on the market. And I believe that's because you know puts are the biggest component of of the of the VIX and, and they're most sensitive to volatility. And if you believe that dealer dealers are short puts, uh, net short puts, well, as the volatility comes down, uh, those puts are losing value. And that means that they're overheads to the downside, right? So like if I have a put that just lost half its value, I don't need to have, you know, as many hedges as I had yesterday. So I'm going to buy some of those hedges back and, or I'm just happy to let the market drift higher, right? I don't necessarily need to adjust my hedges, but, um, I, I, my my general feeling is that if the market is going higher, dealers are happy with that. And so you'll see maybe they'll be less resistant to hedging as the market goes up and or the VIX is sort of just applying that volatility is coming down. So they're going to buy some hedges back. So that's one component. But then two, this open interest comes out once every night at roughly midnight Eastern time. And so in, in the morning, we have our most clear snapshot of what the market is going to look like in terms of our options levels. We obviously have volume all day long right in the SPX and, and news events and the like so you know there's there's nothing to say that these levels control everything all day 
if the Fed comes out and announces a sudden rate cut, the market's going to go higher, right? But where might it settle? Well, I would wager that a lot of times you'll see it settle at one of these big options levels, right? So, so you know, you need to put everything kind of in context. I think we had a million calls trade, a million, uh, 1.2 million contracts trade yesterday. And so a lot of the levels that weren't 3,200 changed uh, change. So like yesterday, 3225 was a big level today. That's not there. Uh, but 3200 is still there because it's so big. So I hope that sort of helps, you know, um, place things in context. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, because because that, that it kind of like, uh, you know, kind of begs the question It goes right right back to it. Like, well, shouldn't the that level always why would the price even even start to uh, 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 drift higher um, uh, and, and grind higher? Uh, it would always kind of go back, go back to the median or the, or the mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, you know, that is my general philosophy, like in 3,200 today, it's a huge level. You have the fed tomorrow. So, you know, but in the morning, if you have market on open, you know, 401k money coming in the market or just net buyers or whatever it may be, you know, they may push the market up in the morning. And, and again, it's just a, it's just a volume thing, right? So if, if whatever the market is doing is outsizing whatever dealers are doing, uh, in a positive game environment, if dealers are selling and, and the whole world's buying, well, the market's going to go up, right? And so that's what makes negative game so interesting is that if the market itself decides to buy or sell and dealers are going with that, it can really create a lot of volatility. And, and if you want to just briefly touch, I know this is slightly off topic, but if you all are seeing the um, the record call positions in equities, you know, there's this sentiment trader um, is the guy on Twitter and he's putting out these charts that are showing that we have the most small trader, uh, quote unquote, small trader positions, long calls ever. Um, and in this situation, you have a negative gamma environment in equities because everybody and their and their mother are buying calls. And so what happens then is dealers are short calls and they need to buy stock. And as the market goes higher, they got to keep buying stock. And as the Fed pumps, they, you know, that just pushes stocks up more and, and dealers got to buy more. And then you end up with this really bizarre environment. Um, and what's funny about it is the SPX, when I look at call levels in the SPX, we don't have anywhere near record levels. And the SPX is a very institutional product, I think. Uh, it's dominated really by, you know, big funds and the like. And so, you know, the the, the contrast there is, is really quite stark and it's, and it's it's a really pretty fascinating moment in time in that respect. Um, so I know that's slightly off topic, but topic, but, but hopefully it helps. No, but. not at all. I mean, it, we're, I mean, really, we're all talking about here is the auction and, uh, this is directly related to it. We're knowing the specific players and, and their positions and, and why it even starts to explain, um, it, it begins to explain this kind of strange market condition we're in right now. Um, uh, it's just, yeah, it's like you say, this is just fascinating stuff. Uh, so, uh, all right, let me get to, to some more questions here as they continue to roll in. Uh, let's see, Otis um, is talking about... Uh, Okay, uh, Otis, I can help you with that about icebergs. Um, no, no icebergs in DX feed uh, unless they're heuristic or synthetic. Uh, they do not uh, have the MBO data uh, that uh, we're looking for. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, David uh, says, uh, Brent, great presentation. Uh, uh, he's a micro trader, probably uh, minority uh, as often uh, guys tell me <laughs> um, comes back to uh, the trading of the big guys I uh, have uh, uh, have much more money um, politely and respectfully are there any prompts uh, it's just hard to read this text here hold on um, are any promos now or uh, um, uh, on like a Black Friday type of thing that you have for the spot gamma uh, website Oh, at the moment, I don't have a, uh, I don't have any discounts. I mean, I, I, I think I offer probably a little bit too low of a price to be honest, but there is a five day trial. And so, you know, it's, it's 25 bucks a month. Uh, and I know it's times are tough for, for a lot of people and it's, and it's hard to invest in new things. And so you get a five day trial, it's the full trial. And if, and if this thing helps you trade, you know, I, I think hopefully you can make, you know, 25 bucks back, you know, pretty quickly. Um, you know, if your situation is, is different, you know, please just email me separately so you can work out, but, but in general, I don't offer any, any discounts on that, on that price. Okay. Excellent. Um, Kendall is asking, what are the most important levels, uh, for you? Uh, so for me, it changes a little bit on a day-to-day -day basis, the size of the level. So the biggest, 
you know, the biggest level is the most important level. So obviously today that's 3,200. Um, and the ball, the ball trigger, that flip level right now, just to give everyone ideas at 3050. So it's, it's very far below where the market is. Um, and so 3,200 today is just really what I'm watching. And, and if I was trading, I would, uh, I personally would probably play mean reversion back to 3,200 for the day, mainly because, you know, the fed is tomorrow and there's, you know, a little bit of obviously uncertainty around that. So it's hard to believe that things really, uh, get cooking, especially with the pull of that level. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, it changes a little bit, but that's why the levels are ranked in that, uh, you know, in book map. Um, so you can sort of see, you know, what should be, what should really be key. Excellent. Um, yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, uh, Will, yes, this will be uploaded as soon as uh, it parses, et cetera. Um, we will uh, upload this to the YouTube channel. You can see uh, yesterday's uh, Scott Pulsini's uh, is, is up there on our YouTube channel. Okay, under the uh, Pro Trader webinar series uh, channel there, or a pr playlist. Uh, let's see, Otis. Uh, yeah, so DX feed uh, uh, the uh, TTW um, uh, 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 indicator uh, will work with DX feed data. Uh, it, it's um, it's just the um, if you're looking for that uh, stop iceberg tracker from from Bookmap. Um, that will only work with rhythmic data and CME uh, futures. The TTW market volume pro works uh, with rhythmic as well as the X feed and the stop run uh, works with the X feed as well with rhythmic. The only what, um, um, yes, Brad, uh, Bruce, excuse me, Bruce said is that the X feed is providing a kind of um, uh, artificial data for icebergs and that's quite uh, difficult to build icebergs on the DX uh, TTW market volume pro but uh, anyway um, TTW market volume pro works for rhythmic as well the X feed uh, as well for the X feed uh, on the base uh, it's it's currently yes is okay okay uh, Justin's asking again um, about when it might bounce price might bounce off um, the, the kind of the wall there of uh, uh, one of your uh, spot gamma uh, levels, or what? What you yeah. look for around maybe um, uh, that level? Yeah. So, well, I'll give like you know the example of this morning. I think we're at thirty-one ninety uh, in the market, and and so based on the fact that I know there was a lot of positive gamma, or I believe there's a lot of positive gamma, and there's a lot of pull at thirty-two hundred. I was looking for a you know a large liquidity area uh, where the market would show support, and that. With the idea that we we're going to retrace to at least 3200 in this case we went through 3200 and then went to 3210 and now we're kind of drifting back to that level so you know you really have to use you know book map and the tools available to sort of surveil and 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 figure out like okay 3200 i know is the key sort of area that we're going to get back to you know nothing says that one big trader can't come in and, and create a stop run and this thing drops to 3185 but in this case knowing that we have positive gamma and 3,200 is a key level. Okay, when do I want to buy, what dip do I want to buy to play that idea of mean reversion? Uh, if we were, let's say that 3,200 was the zero gamma level, I'm looking for a sign that if we break 3,200 that I want to start shorting, right? That I want to, I'm betting the market might really, might really drop and volatility is going to expand there, right? So the, you have to know, you have to put it in the, it, is the level of positive gamma or negative gamma or what environment are we in? And then, you know, how big of a level is it, you know, that I'm going to play off of that. So, you know, again, the 3200 example, I think is probably as, as strong as one as I can give at the moment. Um, in, in some other cases, you know, like uh, what, what you'll see is the market will move to a certain level and will sort of pin or just hang out around that area. Right. So that's why sometimes I say it's a resistance level. Um, the market won't always just sell off from that area. Maybe the 3220, let's say, was a, was a key level for today. You'd see the market maybe trade to 32.25, and then we'll close at 32.20, right? So it becomes more of like a pin area than necessarily an area that you want to like short, if that makes sense. So you really have to read the fingerprints of the market, use all this data. You know, Walter's indicator, the stop runs really seem to line up very interestingly with um, these with these different options level. And so you know, I'm hoping to put a lot of what you're seeing in context uh, to give you sort of a mental edge, I guess, um, or or narrative to you know what what and how the market may be moving. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Yeah, definitely. It, it reverts back to the, the what you we were previously just talking about in terms of it, you know, closing, uh, even though 3,200 is the level, uh, you know, it closing up at uh, maybe, you know, 32, going to 3,225, 
uh, and then but but then drifting off and closing at 3220. Um, uh, you know, st still, I mean, these are guidelines. Uh, they're not. It's right. it's not like it's going to revert back to 3200. Um, uh, you know, because because that's the 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 important level for the day. Um, just that uh, you're looking for uh, insights that that will give that kind of um, uh, uh, you know kind of tip off to it moving back to 3200. Right, and, and so one of one of the things I note, um, you know, the dealers aren't hedging necessarily all day. So a lot of this is, you know, is there a big enough move to to force them to want to trade or or hedge back? Uh, and the other one is, you know, I think the most important times they hedge are first thing in the morning and then going into the close is, is what I think is the most important hedging period. So a lot of times you guys are very familiar with this mean reversion, you know, where the futures will be up a bunch, and then we'll sell off right at the U.S. open or vice versa. And I think a lot of that has to do with hedging. And you'll see that a lot of times we'll open it, let's say, you know, slightly above or below one of these major levels, and then the market will immediately trade to that level. And then also into the close, you know, like, uh, you'll see with well, the last 10 minutes of the day, I always call that last 10 minutes the power hour because so much happens. It's like an hour's worth of movement in 10 minutes. And, you know, you'll you'll see that a lot of times if the VIX is going lower, that will indicate that dealers may have to buy some hedges or sell some hedges. You know, you want to go the opposite way of which the VIX is moving. And that can kind of give you an idea like, okay, there's pressure. There's going to be pressure higher, right, if the VIX drops because theoretically the dealers have deltas to buy. And so you'll see, you know, not always, there's obviously MOC and some other stuff happening depending on the day, but a lot of times you'll see these moves. And I think a lot of that is hedging into the sort of close. Uh, I would note, you know, yesterday we had a $4 billion MOC move, but we had a much higher VIX uh, into the close, right? And so we only got about a five handle move out of that. On the second, we had a $3 billion MOC print and we had a much lower VIX. And I think we, we moved 20 handles in the last 10 minutes. So Again, it's not, the dealers don't control everything, but they, they're gonna influence everything. And sometimes it's also just time frames, right? Like, so 3,200 today is an important pin level. Well, you know, maybe it moves to 3,290 and then goes back, or maybe it moves to 3,215 and then comes back down. You know, it's not gonna be sort of, they don't have a firepower, or no one has enough firepower to hold it directly at 3,200 the whole day. You know? Right, right. Um, just kind of curious, uh, so, if if it uh, let's say price closes up at 3220, uh, even though 3200 was your important level, um, uh, do you just kind of see that a lot of times being the next the next day somewhere around 3220 is the new uh, new kind of important level? Yeah. So it, it, it um, what we do is every morning we we'll, we refresh the data, right? So t this morning or tomorrow morning you're going to see all the refreshed open interest. Um, that show what the important levels are for tomorrow. So in general, if we don't have a big options volume day, then you would say, okay, well, 3,200 is still going to figure in a big way into things because as so happens last night, none of the levels really moved and nothing really changed. So that's why I, you know, I have a strong feeling that 3,200 is going to be you know, back in play for today. Hmm. We see the levels all shift higher. For instance, if 3,300 became the biggest level there is, well, that may be telling you that the options market pricing in a bigger move now. And so a lot of times we'll see what will happen is if you think about all of my levels are almost like a range, right? I have like where the most calls are and then I'll tell you where that is and I'll tell you where the biggest options, you know, total gamma is, right? But what at the absolute gamma level is telling you is where the most calls and puts are as a whole, which is 3,200. So that's a level that's going to keep coming up. But let's say that the most calls were at 3,220 and the market shoots to suddenly 3,250. Well, in my mind, that's telling me that the market is outpacing the options market, the stock, the equity market, the, the futures market is moving above or too fast for the options market. And so a lot of times you'll see the market will have to reset and kind of come back in and check back down into the sort of level. And then the options market will sort of readjust higher, or, you know, uh, sort of confirm the move, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is just fascinating stuff. Um, uh Okay, I hope that answers some questions along the way here, uh, maybe for Justin and some others. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, these will be recorded, uh, guys, and up on the uh, YouTube channel soon. Uh, Bruce, they, I, I emailed you the presentation. I couldn't figure out how to upload it to a folder. Oh, you said something. Okay, so all right. I'll, I'll put that into the into the chat okay. here uh, or the um, handout folder for you guys in just a second. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you, Brent. Um, Let's see. Uh... 
Uh, one other thing to note, uh, I'm, Walter, forgive me if I did, but I, I adjust the SPX levels for futures, and I try to, I just do it once a day, and I just sort of eyeball the SPX and the, and the futures and, and offset it. So I think we're about three handle difference at the moment. Um, so all of my levels are based on SPX options, but I do adjust them just in book map, you know, for, for the futures. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, there must be just massive changes by the, by the close, like you're saying though. Um, uh, yeah. And it, depends on, it really depends on options. Well, I mean, someday, you know, recently we've only had say 800,000 options a, a, a day and that's, you know, there's just, that's not much volume, right? Especially if it's taking place at a strike that like if volume is going off at 3,200 today, you know, that's not, necessarily going to tell you a whole lot uh it, or that's not really going to help you predict much of a move you know uh but if we had 3250 being the highest volume on the day and the vix is lower well then you can kind of glean that we're going to have some buy pressure um you know from that so you know my my product unfortunately tells you sort of what's happening it's a snapshot of this morning and most of those levels should play through the day but but obviously there's a real-time component to this business and so you know you kind of need to eyeball some of those other you know, important uh, factors as well. Right, right, understood. Uh, and, and another question here about like uh, uh, your positioning and, and risk management um, in the uh, uh, in the futures market. So, I mean, basically, like uh, this allows you to really uh, look for much bigger moves, uh, I would imagine. Uh, and, uh, y y you know, like 10 points or more, uh, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, I, I know one of the things I struggle with in my my own personal trading is sort of just having the confidence to let sort of things run between <laughs> levels, um, and and so you know it, it can you know sometimes it can help. I think with over trading, but the other thing is that if it's a negative gamma environment, you may get the confidence to say, okay, let's really let this thing run. I mean, I had some of the largest negative gamma readings I've I've seen you know in March, and and the market would move 100 points in a day, you know, uh, 100 handles multiple times in a day right and so as we get more positive as the gamma grows higher you know that means i want to scalp tighter price swings right i'm looking for tighter moves and and conversely if you know we have sort of flat gamma or you know we're relatively flat at the moment you know 10 20 handle swings i don't think are that as you as everyone has really seen you know those those are pretty common so um the, the other interesting thing is i have some data i didn't include here but if you look at what the largest drawdowns are ever in positive game environments, and I and I break it down by the open and the close, so the overnight session, the day session. Um, when when you have a positive game environment, I think the largest move higher or lower is like two percent or something like that. So what I'm sort of getting at is like you can also sort of have a little bit more confidence in risk in a way when you have positive gamma versus negative gamma, if that if that makes sense. Um, so that can help with position sizing and, and you know, and also sort of, uh, again, letting things run, I guess, and try to capture maybe more handles or, or more of a move. Well, so, I mean, if, if, if you start to see the volatility pick, picking up, I mean, you're going to, you're going to drop your, your sizing is what, is what you're saying. Right. Not only that, but if we have a very positive game environment, I think, you know, right now my, my index is like a, at a, a 0.75. So the highest that can go is a four. And so if we were at like a, a two on my gamma index or a three, in other words, we had very positive gamma, I would have more confidence in playing a mean reversion play. And I would probably size up buying a dip than I would in a day like today when gamma is sort of flat, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I, I personally, I watch the VIX indicator really, I watch the VIX all day, you know, one minute bars. And, and if, you know, if the market is dropping and the VIX is going up, I have, you know, I'm not looking to really buy a dip until the VIX starts to turn around. When the VIX sort of bottoms and starts to turn, then I have a little more confidence to sort of lay into playing a you know buy the dip type situation. Um, you know, and I think that's just really an expression of uh, you know of what the market is pricing on a very short term basis in terms of volatility. Yeah, that that was actually another question I had for you. It's like you you must be watching the VIX very very closely um, uh, because then then that that's what's moving first. Uh, it sounds like, uh, and then and then you're looking for the reaction uh, after that. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously, you know, the VIX is just an expression of of what options are pricing, right? So, you know, it's it's just calculated straight off of what what the uh, what the SPX options market is uh, implied vols are. So, 
you know, that that is really the VIX is just directly a an expression of you know options prices. And so if you think about that and you know when they're turning, you know, that, that can be um an important sign. And, and a lot of times you'll see big moves, sudden moves in the market, and there's no news and there's not really an explanation for it. A lot of times those could be option prints. And if you look at the tape, you'll see, oh, somebody bought a thousand, you know, at the money SPX calls and that needs to be hedged. And that's why suddenly we move, you know, we jump 10 points and you'll see like a stop run or something like that. So, you know, there's a lot of times you'll see these, these moves that are directly, I mean, you can time it to the second with an option sweep. And so, you know, those, those types of things are happening all day. And, um, and a lot of times the VIX will sort of express that for you, or, or you'll be able to see sort of that show up as priced in, in the VIX. Right. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that also just trade options off of this, you know, data. I mean, you know, the futures is, is a, I think an excellent way to, to play between, you know, swings and moves and things like that. Um, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of different trading styles that can be expressed around, I think these levels, you're not sort of locked into one box. Uh, I, I don't know if you're yeah, aware, uh, aware um, uh, Brent uh, and Walter, that uh, uh, Bookmap can now uh, connect to the VIX as well. Yeah, that's what yeah, I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, that's what it, what the, uh, where I wanted to cut in. As uh, as I mentioned, correlations from my point of view are extremely important. So Brent mentioned Wix. Wix. I'm looking the Wix, the VXX, the ETF, the SPI, and uh, as Bruce mentioned, you can also have the Wix uh, index in Bookmap very easily, so that you have everything on your um, let me say fingertips. So that you you can look in parallel on yes and QYM VIX and the VXX for example SPY as well absolutely important to see how is the SPY developing and uh, you will see sometimes like yesterday it was yesterday it was strange as Brent mentioned the weeks was up and the years was up too it was uh, really a <laughs> you remember our chat it was a really strange situation yesterday uh, even after the MOC. Um, it always it's always 10 minutes exactly 10 minutes before the close um it was up 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 and that was a little bit um, scary to see that uh, but um i would like to yes motivate everyone to have a look at the vix and if you are using bookmap then subscribe to the x feed you will get everything you need uh, to have a uh, comprehensive um, view on the yes yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I have not looked at it yet, to be honest, um, and and connected to it. But um, uh, I, I certainly want to want to check it out now. Um, yeah, I would I would also note that that people have taken this gamma data, just the raw data. So you can download a historical uh, the, a historical data set uh, from my site going back to just 2018. But there there are people that trade treasury futures off this gamma data, and I would imagine you could probably devise a fixed strategy as well off of some of these levels. So uh you know there's there's interesting things that you could do outside of just es you know if you were looking at some of the other other products yeah and, and also to note uh i am working on adding in nasdaq um levels as well and a lot of people are asking about that now the nasdaq tends to have a smaller options complex than the um than the spx and so historically when i've looked at it the levels just haven't been all that interesting and all that pertinent but you know admittedly things may have changed in the last <laughs> like two three weeks here Right, right. Uh, really, I mean, this has just been fascinating, guys. Like, um, uh, I'm really, uh, really, really enjoying your your presentation. Uh, David, uh, others are saying is the same thing uh, here as well, and lots, lots of compliments coming in uh, for this presentation. Um, let's see. Okay, Philip is asking. Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, guys, feel free here. I'll put the the date. I'll put all the uh, information back here into the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to them uh, directly uh, if you have other questions, or if I didn't get to your questions here, uh, you can reach out to them directly. They, their their data or their information is in the in the chat there, uh, as well as uh, thank you, Brent. I got the handout. I got the uh, presentation slides. Yes, I, I put it in the handout uh, folders, guys. You can download it right there. Okay, um, and uh, let's see. Uh, Philip is asking um, about pre pre market open uh, or the, before the open here. Um, are your spot gamma uh, levels um, relevant as well? Um, today were some resistance at the L zero, uh, the level zero spot gamma level. Yeah. I, so the the overnight sessions are really interesting. I, I think that they you know. 
it's a 24 hour market. So market makers are required, I think, to sort of hedge bigger. I think they hedge bigger moves. They don't hedge maybe as consistently. The other thing is that the options market itself is not open until uh, like 2 a.m. and there's very little volume trading there. So I think that they hedge big moves. If you remember that sort of Iran bombing example I brought up, I think they'll hedge big moves, but the, the effect is not quite the same. What's interesting is that, and I have some back data I should have put in this uh, in this um, presentation, that I map out the, the uh, expected moves for the market uh, for the overnight session and the day session. And what's interesting is that the uh, for both the day session and overnight session, there's more volatility in the day session than the overnight session. So I don't know if all of you are familiar with that idea that the market makes most of its gains overnight. Um, and if you sort of sold the close and bought the open, you outperform like the cash session by like two to one or something. I'm, I'm probably messing that up, but hopefully that's uh, you, you all have seen that study. And, and so I thought that maybe Gamma had a, had a play in that. And, and so what's interesting is that you get more volatility in the day session than the overnight session, which really was kind of contrary to what I was, uh, was thinking. But in that context, the, the overnight session stays within the confines of the sort of that positive gamma, negative gamma distribution, if you guys remember those dot plots that I was showing. Uh, meaning that there, the same phenomenon exists. It's not like overnight that market makers don't apparently do anything. They clearly do something. Uh, and, and the movements overnight seem to respect the, the cash levels. Um, however, as far as, uh, you know, will the market bounce rate at a certain level that I put in book map? I have a little bit less confidence, particularly in some of the smaller levels um, in an overnight session than I do during the day, just because I don't think the market makers are as active. Interesting. So, so, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, you have a, you know, London session, um, uh, and uh, other, you know, large, uh, uh, players, uh, but, um, you're, you're saying that the volatility in terms of the gamma is, um, uh, during the cash, uh, regular market hours compared to the, uh, overnight, but the overnight has, um, uh, bigger swings in the futures market. Um, so, so the overnight seems to actually have less, and and that seems to actually be particularly pertinent to when there's a negative, big negative gamut in the market. So you get more sell, you get a larger sell-offs in the cash session than you do in ah, the, okay. um, in the in the day session. So I'm trying to dig up the link to that real quick, and I can post it in the uh, in the chat here for everyone to see. Um, so you know the, the the two sessions rhyme. And the other interesting thing is that when you, um, you know, if, 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 in terms of holding overnight risk, a lot of people I think get nervous and things like that. And and, and if you look at the, the data, it actually, I think it help you again with the position sizing and sort of maybe playing larger swings because the statistics are on your side in terms of how big of a move to expect, you know, if you're the type of guy that holds for, you know, multiple days or something like that. Um, I mean, I, I guess that that makes that makes sense then as well. Like, uh, if if it goes below the zero um, uh, during the uh, uh, you know cash session, I mean, that's going to be significant. Um, yeah, and and not you know, and and not only that, when we're already below zero, if you sort of subscribe to this idea that when you have negative gamma, dealers are selling when the market goes lower. You know, they're just expanding the price swings in that respect. And another thing, sort of, you know, think about this, and we didn't talk about this, and but you know, when you when the market is in control of calls, the way that people trade calls and trade around calls is fundamentally different. You know, maybe not today because of the whacked out world we're in, but in general, uh, puts are much more sensitive to implied volatility, right? So you need to be more active with your put position than you would maybe with a call position because the you know puts are so sensitive to implied vol. So if you have a bunch of puts right now and the market goes down two, three percent, you're probably going to roll those puts out. You're going to make some adjustment, right? If you hold those because you know that even if the market just sort of settles down, implied vol will come down and you're not maximizing your profit or maximizing your hedge, right? Well, if the market goes up two, 3% against your calls, they're not gonna be as sensitive, like implied vol is gonna come down. And so you're maybe more likely to hold those calls and let and, and see what plays out. Does that make sense? So yes. if, the puts, if the market drops and your puts go into money, you're gonna roll those puts down or close them, right? So when you do that and everyone does that in mass, what that's doing is dealers who are short puts are suddenly now flat, right? Or they're, they have less puts than they had before. So when they were short a thousand futures, let's say, and a whole bunch of puts just got closed, well, not, maybe now they only need 800 futures. And so they're gonna buy those back. So that that concept of just where what's going on right now, are, are we in call, are we 
in, embedded by calls right now or are we embedded by puts that the way that people are trading and moving around you know uh, with those put positions versus call positions i think is a big reason there's so much change in volatility hmm. um if that you know if that makes sense i mean where we have record long call positions right now in in equities right and i and this is a whether you want to say this is retail people and whatever else I, you know whoever someone's making a lot of money right good for them on I calculated as of two days ago that 40% of the most concentrated equity positions are in the 619 expiration. So what that is telling you that is that if we have all these guys long calls and theoretically those deals are hedged with long stock, right? Because the deals are short those calls. On 619, those positions are going to go away. So what's going to happen? You have, all, you know, theoretically guys, you know, the deals are short, or, or excuse me, the deals are long a bunch of stock. And then maybe you won't need all those stock positions anymore right now the positions could get rolled out people could start trading them slowly over time whatever it may be but my point is the same that the last time we had record call positions was at the end of february i don't think there's any coincidence that we saw record call positions and then they those expire and then the market you know drops now maybe it's yet coronavirus and some china headlines or whatever over that weekend so you have the right setup and the market sort of gets some bad news and bad news suddenly really matters, right? And then the market tanks, but, you know, so you had a catalyst in this perfect setup and you sort of have a very interesting, you know, this is sort of mirroring that same situation. Right? Yeah. But I mean, the point is, is, is well taken. Um, and I, there's definitely something to it because uh, the coronavirus news had been out for quite a while, but the market did not move. In fact, it continued right. to grind higher. Uh, right. It wasn't. Yeah, and, it wasn't until what, what you're noticing here in, in that star on on that on your chart. That, yeah, and I, and I would you know I would I would note something else. I mean, this whole market climbing. I mean, yes, we have massive you know Fed stimulus, and I'm not an economist, and I'm not even gonna you know pretend to understand that whole world. But I would just note that you know we have this rampant call buying, and and you know riots don't matter, and you know, coronavirus infections don't matter and, and, uh, and bad China news comes back out, still doesn't matter. You know, all these sort of things are not, not even stopping the market from going up. You know, we were up 10% in, in since the last options expiration. Um, news seems to matter more in negative gaming environments. And, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the, I, I just find that, I just find that fact very, you know, very interesting. I mean, make of it, you know, what you, what you sort of will. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll we'll be looking for that that date um, uh, with the with the quad quad witching, uh, and I guess we'll we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I put I think I put the link to that. Where did it go there? I just put a link in the screenshot to the overnight uh, versus day chart, so everyone who's interested can, can pop over and take a look. Okay. Uh, where, where did you um Where did you put in the it? Chat. Okay. Let me. I think you might maybe it went to me here. Oh, um, okay. So uh, make make sure you say, it says uh, to all uh, okay. entire audience, uh, and then send it. Okay, I think I did. All right, there we go. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I still do not see it in there. Um. Okay. Yeah. Now. Now there, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, got it. Excellent. Um, okay, uh, one one other question. I, I I was just curious, Brent, um, about any sort of like studies or correlations between the um, uh, options on close versus the the um, um, uh, overnight session after. Um, I'm sorry. Say that question again. Oh, options on close. Uh, uh, yeah. So like at, at you know at four o'clock. Um, yeah. And and then. Uh, uh, then the the following uh, overnight session, yeah, uh, and the relationship there. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I think that so that link I just sort of sent you, I think sort of sort of is my more, most detailed study of of sort of what the correlation and what the link is there, and the two sessions, you know, the overnight session seems to really still respect sort of the gamma price distribution, I guess is is sort of what I'd say, and so. Um, you know, you have other players, I think, step in, you know, Asia and the like that are that have other axes to grind, so to speak. But a big enough move will still be met, I think, by by dealers having to get some th certain things done. I mean, they need to hedge. It's a 24 hour business. And so, you know, I think that's why we see the 
overnight session stay within the confines of the expected you know price distributions uh, but in terms of i have more confidence in the cash session be because the options markets are open um, and that actually sort of leads to an interesting point point you know i talked about that iran bombing and why the market bounced at zero gamma the, the options market was not open at that moment and so if you think about what maybe would have happened if the options market was open and VIX spikes, that suddenly changes the way that dealers maybe need to hedge, right? Because a VIX spike is telling you puts are worth more. And so if I'm short puts, I need a bigger hedge, right? I need to adjust how it is I'm gonna operate because those options are suddenly going in my face. Um, so, so that could be one reason that there's more volatility in the day session because you have the active VIX uh, versus, you know, a lot of that overnight session, you know, may not be the same thing. Um, granted, the options market does open at two in the morning, but uh, it's, it's you know sort of an interesting concept that I've been been studying. I I, I had um, one more question uh, for you um, regarding um, uh, book map in the order flow. Um, I've had this uh, uh, you know I haven't I personally have not looked at options. Um, uh, just been so busy with so many different things at book map, uh, but it just seems to me that um, uh, I mean you can just scoop up some incredible prices like when the implied volatility expands let's say let's say price is dropping um, um, you know very quickly but into high levels of liquidity and you can see that they're staying in the book and absorbing uh, mm -hmm. have you found any sort of like a, a you know kind of a, a trading uh, a strategies from from that um, uh, from, so, from book, in, in book map uh, using book yes yes yeah, so well well, the, I mean, the, the biggest strategies I'm looking for are, you know, I have this this narrative, and, and I think this is what you're asking, is, you know, this narrative of what I think the market should do based on, you know, being a positive gamma or negative gamma environment, and then, you know, what are those levels that are laid out for me? Uh, you know, in book map, as you see, you know, the, the spot gamma levels on that screen. And so, you know, the convergence of those things, and again, you know, uh, Walter's stop run, uh, and Delta indicators and the TTW indicators have been very helpful because I, I have a, be a belief that the market's going to turn. As you know, in this in this business, it's kind of horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Like you want to try to get close with a lot of these levels, but it can be tough to pick the exact bottom or the exact top, right? And so I'm looking for the change in market tenor around my levels that sort of fit my narrative. And then, you know, then I know that I can, you know, take a shot, if that makes sense. So the visualization of the liquidity how the market's actually reacting at a level, it, does it confirm what it is that I think is supposed to happen, right? Do I think it, you know, it's supposed to be a buy the dip, sell the rip market, does that look like what's happening right now? Understood. Uh, do we get a stop run into a level that I know is a is a big options level and there should be support there? Um, and then I can play that mean reversion. So um, so what Bookmap has really done is, is allowed me sort of to confirm beliefs or and or watch levels that I think matter and then I know that I can uh, make plays off of those levels because bookmap is actually giving me like you know the actual words to the story like I know the story in my head but bookmap is telling me okay here's here's, here's like chapter one this is exactly when you can start and then that, that makes sense yeah no I, absolutely that's why like uh, um this has been um just such a uh, I think powerful uh, presentation of Understanding the the bigger picture here uh, with these uh, spot gamma levels, uh, and then uh, and then uh, Walter uh, looking at the uh, the order flow uh, uh, to support uh, that bigger picture and on those levels. Yeah, yeah. So so like for instance, right now if you look at in my book map, I have a big yellow bar. At, you know, thirty two twenty is sort of this yellow area, and so we have this combined profile indicator, which which Walter was talking about, and that. We have 3224 and SPX, so you have to adjust that a few points for uh, for futures, right? Few few points down. That that's a very big gamma. There's a lot of positive gamma at that level, which means there's a big call position sitting there. Um, and so, you know, I always find it fascinating. Like, why why would 3220 have this liquidity posted out there? Um, you know, I don't. These things seem to correlate all the time. It's quite, quite interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I think we've gotten through um, all of the uh, all the questions here, uh, and um, I really just uh, want to extend thanks uh, to both of you. This has uh, been really uh, uh, fascinating, enlightening uh, presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, guys, uh, thank you, um, and uh, we'll have the recording up soon, uh, and uh, I'll send you, uh, Brent and um, and Walter, the 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 link as as soon as I get it as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. Thank and thanks for your time too, Walter. And uh, hope to hear from everybody soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.